Good morning. So glad that you could join us today. This is the June 19, 2014 Public Health Nursing IT Week, and my name is Joy Hoskins. I'm the Chief Nursing Officer for the Department. We have a great agenda today, um, ranging everything from uh, Shiga toxin producing E. coli to maternal and child health uh, efforts across the state. Uh, through local health departments and our and our partners, and Title X uh, updates on the IME committee requirements, and then I have a few closing uh, updates from the nursing office to share with you. So with that, we'll go ahead and and start with uh, Tracy. If you want to come on up, Tracy Bond is a registered nurse and a nurse consultant with the Reportable Disease Branch, and we're glad to have her with us today. Uh, she is going to be speaking about Shiga toxin producing E. coli. Note that this um, offering counts for uh, not only nursing CEs, but also um, an ERRT hour, uh, one, one credit hour. So make sure that you complete your certificate of attendance and submit that per the instructions that the Reportable Disease Branch has sent to you to receive those ERRT hours. So Tracy, I think we've got your presentation all pulled up here. Is that somebody with their mic open? Mr. Wallen, can you tell who that is? Somebody's got their mic open out. Okay, you got it, thank you. Okay, Tracy, thanks again for being with us today. Good morning. Um, thank you, Joy, for having me today. Um, I want to go ahead and start on the presentation because we will be limited for time this morning. And if you could hold your questions until the end. Okay. Um, the objectives today, first of all, we're going to describe shikatoxin producing E. coli. We're going to discuss the signs and symptoms, uh, describe the complications, the transmission, and risk factors the laboratory testing and interpretation, the incidents that we have here in Kentucky. We're going to look at the shigatoxin producing E. coli outbreak, uh, treatment options, prevention and control measures, and then at the end, we're going to demonstrate um, the lab entry for shigatoxin producing E. coli into NIDS because that does seem to be one of the most difficult um, labs to enter. Okay. What is Escherichia coli? E. coli are large and diverse group of bacteria that live in the intestines of humans and animals. Most are harmless, but some do cause infection. Some cause... Estel County, your mic is open. Estel? Your mic's open. Thanks. He's getting it. Ready? Okay. Uh, some do cause diarrhea, others cause um, urinary tract infections, and that's usually from poor toileting. Some also cause upper respiratory infections, such as pneumonia. What are shigatoxin producing E. coli? As I said, some cause disease, making a toxin. The E. coli bacteria that makes these toxins are called STEC. Most commonly identified STEC is E. coli 0157, which you hear about a lot. Many other non-0157 shigatoxin producing E. coli cause disease. There's actually 50 serotypes that cause human illness. Right now, they are looking at what they call the big six, which is E. coli 026, 045, 0103, 0111, 0121, and 045. Some cause bloody diarrhea and kidney failure, which we will talk about a little further into the presentation. So who gets shigatoxin producing E. coli infections? People of any age can actually become infected. Uh, the very young children and the elderly are more likely to develop uh, severe illness and also hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS, which is a type of kidney failure. But even healthy older children and young adults can become seriously ill. What are the signs and symptoms? Primarily, uh, most people get severe stomach cramping, also accompanied with diarrhea, which is often bloody. Vomiting, fever if present, it's usually not very high. 
Most people are better within five to seven days. However, others do become severely ill and it can become life-threatening. When do signs and symptoms appear? We look at the incubation period, which is the time between actually ingesting uh, stuck bacteria and feeling sick, usually three to four days after exposure. It may be as short as one day or as long as 10 days though. Often begins very slowly with just mild stomach pain or diarrhea. HUS, which is a type of kidney failure, if it occurs, usually develops seven days after the first symptom, um, which diarrhea is normally improving at that time. Complications of STEC. Five to 10% of our cases who are diagnosed with STEC develop HUS. Signs and symptoms of HUS include decreased frequency of urination, becoming very tired, losing pink color in the cheeks and inside the lower eyelids. HUS does require hospitalization because kidneys may stop functioning and other serious problems may develop. Most people with HUS recover within a few weeks, but some suffer permanent damage or even die. And currently in Kentucky, we have children who are still on a waiting list for kidney transplants, and we have had HUS deaths across Kentucky. Um, last year as a nurse consultant for STEC, we actually experienced um, the first death since I've been covering this disease for five years. Um, and by the end of the year, we actually had two, and these were in perfectly healthy, uh, normal children. So. As we talk further, I'd like for you all to keep that in mind as just how serious this can be. So where does STEC come from? STEC live naturally in the guts of animals such as cattle, sheep, deer, and elk. The major source for human illness is cattle. It causes human illness even though the animals themselves may not be sick. There's other kinds of animals such as pigs and birds, and you may pick up STEC from the environment in which it's spread. When you swallow STEC, it's usually tiny, usually invisible, but it amounts of human or animal feces in your mouth is actually what we're talking about. It doesn't sound very pleasant. Uh, consumption of contaminated food, it can be unpasteurized or raw milk, water that's not been disinfected, contact with cattle or contact with infected feces. Some examples of that would be eating unwashed fruits or vegetables, working with cows in a dairy barn, and then not using proper hand hygiene, changing diapers, eating undercooked hamburger or swallowing lake water while swimming, they're all risk factors for stay. Touching the environment in petting zoos, eating food prepared by someone who did not wash their hands after using the restroom. So I'll let you all look at this slide. I think it's pretty self-explanatory as we look at routes of transmission for stay. Um, you know, stay can actually contaminate um, the railings, um, it can be on the ground, in feed bins, or even on the fur of animals. So that's something that you need to think about with children who are visiting petting zoos, for example. How are stick infections diagnosed? Through laboratory testing of stool specimens normally, identifying the specific strain of stick is essential. Labs that test for shiga toxins can detect non-0157s now. Shigatoxin positive specimens must be sent to the Kentucky Division of Laboratory Services, DLS. This will allow us to have further serotyping and perform what's called PFGE analysis. And that's how outbreaks are identified. That is how Kentucky may be connected with other states. Um, and we often look at those outbreaks nationally. This next slide here is actually an example of the pulse fill gel electrophoresis, which we like to call PFGE. As you all can see um, in the different lanes, you'll have um, three different ends on there, which are the standards. And then if you look at lanes one, two, four, and five, they're very similar as we would call indistinguishable. Um, so that is what we would look at in our PFGE lab and our lab scientists upload these patterns to uh, CDC's PulseNet database. Okay, first of all, when you all get a lab report, um, it may be preliminary or a presumptive lab. You may get a lab report that says suspicious for E. coli 0157H7. Or you may get one that says no routine enteric pathogens isolated, including Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, or Stech. You may get one that says just simply E. coli Shigatoxin 1 detected, or presumptive E. coli Shigatoxin type 1 or type 2, E. coli 0157H7 positive that may be performed via rapid test, 
E. coli O157H7 non-shiga-like toxin producing detected. E. coli shiga toxin EIA positive or positive shiga-like screen. So as you look at this, there's going to be many variations with this. The most important thing to keep in mind is when you get that first test, that's when the investigation actually begins. And if there's a question about the test result, I strongly encourage you to call me or someone else in the reportable disease section um, so that we can look at that test if you have questions about it. Because the sooner the investigation begins, the better food history recall you're going to get, for example. And here in Kentucky, we have what's called the Foodborne Waterborne Illness Questionnaire, which is currently um, being updated, and we hope that that will be in NIDS soon. But right now, we have the older version of the Enteric Disease Questionnaire in NIDS. And we'll look at that a little bit further once we get into the NIDS demonstration. This next slide is a picture of what they call the immunocard stat testing. And you can see that there's actually um, a line for the control or toxin 2 and one below. This is the new standard of care, unfortunately, in rapid E. coli testing. It detects all sugar toxin producing E. coli and differentiates between the 1 and 2 for optimal patient management while complying with CDC recommendations. It's a rapid test for the qualitative detection of sugar toxin 1 and 2, and it's produced by E. coli and cultures derived from clinical specimens only. Here's just a fun picture when you look at uh, testing for non-0157 shigatoxin producing E. coli. More and more labs have begun using the simpler test that we just looked at to help detect non-0157. So here you can see an 0111, 0103, for example. Now, once you get a final lab report that's been sent to the Division of Lab Services, you may get a report that says shigatoxin positive, unable to isolate shigatoxin producing organisms. It may say no growth after 48 hours. It may have E. coli 026 shigatoxin type 1 positive, 0103 shigatoxin type 2 positive, E. coli 0157H7 shigatoxin 1 and 2 positive. You may actually get reports back that say shigatoxin negative or unsatisfactory specimen for testing or no E. coli isolated. Once again, the final labs also need to be entered into NIDS, and that's what we're going to look at a little bit further in the NIDS demonstration. Okay. I wanted to actually provide you all with a slide that consisted of what you would need specifically for entering the lab report. We will look at this further when we do the NIDS demonstration. But just to reiterate the steps, First of all, you're going to go to Open Investigations, and you'll select the condition, which would be shigatoxin producing E. coli for this demonstration. And then you would also make sure that you have the correct case patient. Then you would go under Manage Associations, and then you'll get a little square that comes up, and you'll click OK to continue, and then you will add the lab report. It's always important to put the reporting facility in there, and if it's an outreach lab from the Division of Lab Services, there is a quick code that we can put in, and I'll show you that when we do the demonstration. The lab report date, that is very important, and that's going to be at the bottom of your outreach report in the center. Specimen source, very important for us to know if it's a stool specimen, if it's blood, if it's urine, and that's located under the general information of the lab report. Date of collection, that's also very important for us to look at particularly when we are in an outbreak situation. We like to have that information, so it is necessary to enter that, and that's found in the upper left-hand corner of the Division of Lab Services report. The test results, we will look at the search options that are in NIDS, and there's a long and a short list to look at. The organism is extremely important that you get the correct one in there. Text results, sometimes you actually have to manually enter certain things, such as the shigatoxin report itself. The result status. When you get a result from the Division of Lab Services, that's considered the final result. We are going to track those isolates if they're positive. So we would say, yes, an isolate was received at the lab, or if it was sent to another state public health lab. For example, some of our areas actually have uh, specimens that are sent to maybe Alabama State Public Health Lab or Ohio State Public Health Lab. Um, we can actually enter those results as well into our system, so it's important to know how to do that. The date received, that's going to be up in the uh, left-hand corner as well, and it'll say date or time flagged in. 
the State Public Health Lab isolate ID. That's how Kentucky is identified during outbreak situations, and that's going to be the eight-digit lab medical rec number in the left-hand corner as well. Is it confirmed at the State Public Health Lab? Yes. And is it forwarded to CDC? Oftentimes we don't know that, so you can put in unknown. All right. We always refer to our case definitions, no matter what reportable disease you're looking at. It's extremely important that you refer to your case definition. So a little bit of background for sugar toxin producing E. coli. Yes, it can cause illness that ranges from mild diarrhea to bloody diarrhea, as we've already talked about. It can be life-threatening, causing HUS. STEC are categorized into sterile groups by their somatic O antigen. The STEC sterile group most commonly identified, as I've already spoke of, is E. coli 0157. However, there are over 50 other sterile groups that cause human disease. In the clinical description, we look at an infection of variable severity characterized by diarrhea, which is often bloody with abdominal cramping. Illness may be complicated by HUS. Uh, some clinicians still use the term thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, TTP, for adults with post-diarrheal HUS. Asymptomatic infection may occur, and the organism rarely does cause uh, extraintestinal infection. Okay, when we're looking at the case definition, laboratory criteria that's necessary uh, for confirmation is isolation of stack from a clinical specimen, E. coli 0157 isolates that produce the H7 antigen, those are assumed to be shigatoxin producing. That's the only one that's assumed to be shigatoxin producing. For all other E. coli isolates, the shigatoxin production or the presence of shigatoxin genes must be determined for it to be considered stack. Both asymptomatic infections and infections at other sites other than the GI tract, if laboratory confirmed, are considered confirmed cases that need to be reported. Other supported lab results, you may have a case with isolation of E. coli 0157 from a clinical specimen, but the H antigen is not detected. Identica identification of an elevated antibody titer to a known stack serotype from a clinically compatible case I can say since I've been here, I've actually only seen uh, the antibody titer once, so that's not one of the testing methodologies that you see very much anymore. Identification of a sugar toxin in a specimen from a clinically compatible case without the isolation of the stick, I do see those lab reports frequently. When you look at epi links, that's a clinically compatible case that is epidemiologically linked to a confirmed or probable case. All right. So to divide, divide this down into what we call our suspect cases, our probable cases, and our confirmed cases. A suspect case is someone who's had post-diarrheal HUS, looking at the HUS case definition, of course, or identification of a sugar toxin in a specimen from a clinically compatible case without isolation of the sex. A probable case is a case with isolation of E. coli 0157 from a clinical specimen without confirmation of the H antigen or sugar toxin producing, or this could be a clinically compatible case who is a contact of a stick case, or is a member of a defined risk rate group during an outbreak, which is often identified in our case definition. Identification of an elevated antibody titer to a known stick serotype from a clinically compatible case. Now, in order to meet true confirmation, a case has to be confirmed at the laboratory and when available, have the O and H antigen serotype characterization that needs to be reported. Okay, just to give you all some idea, I wanted to show you how common stick infections are here in Kentucky, um, as you can see in the bottom of the chart. But an estimated 265,000 stick infections occur each year across the United States. Of those, 36% are 0157. Not all stick infections are diagnosed still. Many do not seek medical care, and many who do will not provide a specimen. Many labs still, unfortunately, do not test for non-0157. So when you look at the bottom here, you can see um, in the United States, we had over 5,000 in 2012, over 6,000 in 2011, and in 2010, again, over 5,000. So Kentucky ranks pretty well when you look at our standings. Um, for 2013, we actually confirmed 102 cases here in Kentucky. So that's higher 
than the previous three years. As you can see, 2012, we had 87, 2011, 74, and in 2010, 70 cases reported and confirmed for Kentucky. When you look at the incidence of sugar toxin producing E. coli in Kentucky, um, we have 0157, 026, and 0103 being the most commonly identified serotypes that we see here in Kentucky. 0157, of course, is the highest. You can see that it starts to increase in April and really peaks in July, midsummer, and then starts to go down back in the fall. When you look here at the top three sugar toxin producing E. coli serotypes by age, you can see that less than five years of age is the most common age. Um, you also can see that females have a tendency to be a little bit higher in the age range of five to nine and 20 to 59, and then also greater than 60 years. Specifically, when you look at 0157 cases, you can see um, the month of collection down at the bottom and then the number of cases on the left-hand side. July was extremely high last year um, for 0157 cases here in Kentucky. We had 20 cases reported and confirmed just in that month alone. When you look at the age groups for the 0157, um, again, less than five years of age is the highest. That's why it's extremely important um, to educate those children on hand washing and watch them when they're going to the petting zoos and also watching with cross-contamination in the kitchen at home. Um, age five to nine, you can see the females, once again, outweigh the males. When we look at the 026 pattern, which is our second most common pattern here in Kentucky, July, again, was the highest month. Um, we had five of the 026 particular serotypes. And when you look at the age distribution again, this one's a little bit different. You see that the females were between 20 and 59 years of age, but the rest of the cases were males for the 026 pattern, which is a little unique when you look at that. The 0103, mid-summer, you're getting July, August, and September. So just a little bit later with the 0103, um, August was the peak month for those cases. We had four cases confirmed in August and three in September. When you look at the age and the gender ratio again, um, females, between 20 and 59, also with the 0103 serotype. We had four cases um, of females in that particular age group and three males. Otherwise, they're kind of sporadically divided. Now, let's look at our multi-state um, outbreaks. You are seeing more and more of those advertised on TV. Um, the news gets wind of these and they like to let the public know, which is good. Um, so when you look at these, there are a lot of things that are commonly eaten, ready-to-eat salads, frozen food products, spinach and spring mix that you're going to see in your bag section, uh, raw clover sprouts, very common, uh, romaine lettuce. Uh, we had a large outbreak of 0104 for um, individuals who had traveled to Germany. You will also see a lot of beef products down towards the bottom that were positive for 0157H7. But now we are starting to see more and more outbreaks that are non-0157. You do see on here that we have the 026, the 0145, and the 0121. So we are seeing more and more of these um, all the time. We also have the 0145 again on here. When I started in 2009, that's when we had the large cookie dough outbreak. So I vividly remember that outbreak. Kentucky usually has matches that are linked to these national outbreaks. So what you do every day does make a difference with your case investigation. That's why it is extremely important to do it when you get the first lab report that comes in. How long are these infections carried? Sex typically disappear from feces when illness resolves, but some may shed for several weeks or months, particularly with our young children who carry sex a lot longer than adults. Thus, repeat testing is extremely important with food handlers, healthcare workers, or our school and daycare attendees. Work and school exclusions may differ by jurisdiction. Treatment. When you look at treatment for STEC, it's usually non-supportive, uh, non-specific therapy, such as just the rehydration, getting oral fluids in. Antibiotics should not be used to treat the infection. 
There's no evidence that treatment with antibiotic therapy is helpful, and actually taking antibiotics increases the risk of HUF. No antidiarrheal agents, um, so definitely no emodium. No antimotility agents when bloody diarrhea is present. This also can increase the risk of HUF. So the keys to present, or preventing stick is cleaning, washing hands and surfaces off often, separating, separating raw meats from other foods, cooking at appropriate temperatures, chilling, refrigerate your food promptly. Prevention and control measures, make sure that the meats are cooked thoroughly using a thermometer. Prevent cross-contamination in the food prep areas by thoroughly washing after touching any raw meat. Um, Particularly with your cutting boards, that's what we see a lot when we are doing the questionnaires, as people will use the same cutting board for their fruits and vegetables as they used for their raw chicken, for example. That's a definite no. Avoid raw milk or unpasteurized juices, such as fresh cider. Avoid swallowing water when swimming or playing. That's extremely difficult for our young kiddos. You know, they are constantly in the pool, in the lake, and what are they doing? They're talking, they've got their mouth open, so there's more risk of swallowing that bacteria. Return of recovered case to food service, daycare, or patient care. The diarrhea needs to be resolved. Um, we need to collect two successive stool cultures that are negative for stick infections, and it's extremely important that they're collected at least 24 hours apart and at least 48 hours after the last dose of antibiotics if they were given. Additional food service criteria for exclusions and restrictions uh, for return to work are in the 2010 Kentucky Food Code for reference. Some of the references that I use today, I do want to make note to you all at the local health department to have on hand because the same references that I use every day are the very ones that you all need to use. Your CCDM, your C Control of Communicable Disease Manual, your Red Book, the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is one of Dr. Brawley's favorites. I also refer to the CDC website and look at the MMWR. Today I want to make specific um, acknowledgments um, to a lot of our section staff. Heather Flanagan, who is our assistant epidemiologist in the section now, she did the epi curves and data for me. I also want to recognize our IT department who um, has going to help with our NEDS demonstration. We've got Kathy Green, Terry Grimes, and Cervanti. Um, we have a new foodborne and waterborne epidemiologist. I still say new, she's been here about a year now. But JC Logston, who I work hand in hand with every day. Also, Carol Rush, our lab epi connector, who I usually talk to at least once a day on the phone. Mike Chardine, who will be helpful for the NEDS demonstration today. I'm sure many of you all have spoke to him uh, on the phone before. And TJ Sugg, who a lot of you all know as our uh, epidemiologist for our section. You talk to him many times, probably via phone or via email for your ERRP or when he worked in preparedness. Okay, um, I'd like to see if there's any questions before we jump into the NEDS demonstration. I'm going to go ahead and put the link up to the training site that we're going to be using today. You will need the username and password that's listed here, so I'll give you all a chance to log on to that and if there's anyone that has any questions. Okay, if there's no questions, we're going to go ahead and proceed to the NEDS demonstration.
<laughs> is, there, is there anything else open, TJ? Or the is there any other explorer that's open right now? We may have to close out of everything. And, and I don't know if that's why you get an error. Well, that's what they told you. We did test this before we started on it. Mm -hmm. Right. No words. <laughs> Whoever just uh, cleared their throat, uh, could you mute your microphone, please? Mike? I, that's all I know. I don't know why. <laughs> Folks been having problems lately. We did yesterday. I'm not sure if they have any problems. Mm -hmm. And they may be. It, it worked this morning. Mm -hmm. Is it still in the room? Trying to push it out? Everybody? I have no idea. We had issues with the online gateway yesterday. Oh, really? So, yeah, mm -hmm. it has been down for. Did you, guys, did you guys test this morning? Yeah, yeah. it worked. worked. Mm -hmm. no, I haven't got anything else that said it should be down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's still there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've never seen that error either. I'm check on that. I just shot an email to somebody to see if I know. Yeah, they really need to use this. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, you can skip and go forward and come back. Maybe get to Ronti and see what problem. She's finished with the presentation. This is going to be the end. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is why it's going to be the second half. Is anyone out there trying to log in too? Are you having difficulty or were you able to get into the training site?
Okay, so bear with us a little bit. <laughs> We're sorry. You think it's just the training side? It could be, because Ned, the online gateway was down yesterday, yeah. so they may be having problems again. While we're waiting, Tracy, you can answer a few questions. Yeah, she can go ahead and answer questions, though. I still have a really difficult time trying to figure out what the safest way is to wash fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Okay, because, I mean, you can cook meat, you can cook vegetables. But what about when you're having salad? And, and you know, there's going to be a new focus on this especially in the schools and the daycares and places like that. What is the best way to educate those who are preparing food mm -hmm. in cleaning of fresh fruits and vegetables? Well, obviously with some fruits and vegetables, you can use a colander and using running water and scrubbing them. Other um, vegetables, for example, when we had the cantaloupe outbreak, um, that would be a fruit. But they were looking at, you know, whether it was good to use a scrubbing brush on the outside because it's so porous. But sometimes the bacteria is on the inside, and no matter how much you clean, unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't get rid of it. Um, but actually, just using, you know, the running water and scrubbing vigorously, and using a colander if you have that for strawberries or any other um, small fruits or vegetables. The immuno card that snack card can you use on food? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, to me, that would be a great place to start before you start fixing the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dr. Brawley actually sent us um, something interesting this week. Um, that had come out was that they were advising um, to not wash raw chicken because people who were washing their raw chicken, that water would splash up on other things and so that bacteria would then contaminate anything else um, that they might have out on their countertop or whatnot. So that's one of the newest recommendations that's come out that he sent to us this week. Would you say that the majority of cases you've seen, and well, you're, you're looking at 2010 to 2012 with your statistics, are you saying that since you mentioned petting zoos, is that the most common? It's not um, the most common. It is very common. Um, daycares are very common. Um, swimming pool and lake exposure is very common. Um, but it ranks right up there with the contaminated foods. Um, crop contamination in the home or for example when we have um, a family that lives on a farm and dad's out working with the cattle and he wears those boots in the house and then you've got a toddler running around on the floor and the carpet and of course they put everything into their mouth so so are there any kind of new recommendations for daycare centers or petting zoos I mean I know daycare centers are already using isn't it a bleach type solution to clean all the toys and Services and things like that in the daycares. Is there anything new for petting zoos or for, you know, uh, to advise parents taking children to petting zoos? You know, um, obviously more and more petting zoos are becoming aware of this as we've had outbreaks with them. So they are offering more cleaning stations around. But I always advise, you know, for field trips or whatnot, to have um, hand sanitizer at least with them, which is not as good as. Uh, soap and running water, but it's better to have that than nothing at all um, if you go to a petting zoo uh, that doesn't have any cleaning stations. But the hand sanitizer, is it an effective? It's not as effective. Not. Okay, because I understood from the ERRT conference that they needed some type of a bleach solution, am I correct, rather than just the alcohol sanitizer? For cleaning like toys and surfaces, yes. And then we actually recommend the commercial grade um, dishwasher if available for daycares. Again, We're trying. Okay. The, the computer's taking its time rebooting. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure most of you all out there have experienced this frequently. Um, if you're used to using NEDS, you know that it is slow. 
show the next presentation because this computer won't <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps a, a system or a server issue, and so that's it's not necessarily specifically related to the NEDS piece of it, but it might be bigger than that. So what we'll do is go ahead and move on to the safe and sound video. I apologize that we did not have the NEDS piece. Can't do the video until yeah, uh -huh. that right, right. So as soon as as um, if you want to take a break, where the the computer here is. Spinning, gyrating, and <laughs> waiting, and so uh, we'll wait for like maybe five more minutes and see if we can get it up. If not, we may have to uh, reschedule the the rest of the presentations for today. Okay. Okay. If you want to take a five-minute break, we'll touch back with us in just a few minutes. Apologize for any inconvenience.
Hey everybody, this is Frankfurt. We'll be getting started again in just one minute. Hello again. I apologize for our um, IT complications um, that we were not able to get back onto the NES website. Uh, fortunately, we think that we will be able to proceed with the um, safe and sound video with Joe Allen's here. He's going to help us with that. I wanted to uh, provide just a little overview of the video. Um, that was produced by KET. It was aired, I believe, on April 21st, and we recently shared this video with our DPH all. Are, are you here with Material and Child Hale? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm not hand. Yeah, what, okay. Um, we, we recently shared the video with um, all of DPH staff at our recent uh, meeting, and so I, we, it was such a hit um, and provided such a broad range overview of uh, all, many of the services that we are providing, both through um, at the state level, through our, with our local health department partners, um, and other community partners across the state, that I felt like it would be uh, very interesting and relevant um, for, for you all to see and be able to uh, connect some of those thoughts for all of your efforts that you provide in and you know, each and every day. Uh, to support emotionally happy and healthy children. So I'm going to ask you to come on up if you want to and, and say a few words. You want to introduce yourself? Yes. And we're running just a minute, couple minutes ahead because okay. we had technical difficulty with the other presentation, so okay. I apologize. So why don't you go on up there? And the camera is right there across the room in the oh, corner. Right. In the corner, yeah. far away. <laughs> Um, my name is Kylan Smith, and I work with Ham Central Office here in Frankfurt. Um, and I guess it sounds like you've already gotten a pretty good introduction already, but uh, and I assume you're all kind of familiar with Hands. We do voluntary home visiting um, across the state, um, and we appreciate everyone in the audience taking the time to come out today. Uh, the name of this documentary is called Safe and Sound: Raising Emotionally Healthy Children in a Stressful World. And it was produced by KET in a partnership with or with support from a foundation for a healthy Kentucky. And uh, we all want our children to grow up to be happy, secure, and healthy adults. But how much do we really know about what actually happens? Research on brain development shows that positive early experiences are critical for long-term mental and physical health. When young children do not receive proper nurturing, or they experience trauma or constant stress, it can have serious repercussions on their development. So in this, um, in this KET special report, we'll explore why social and emotional development is so important in the first years of life, then look at the impact on childhood adversity, both for the individual and for society, and we'll learn how Kentucky communities and agencies are helping parents be the best they can be. So, um, if it's ready to start, I hope you enjoy the show. By a grant from the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky, investing in communities, informing health policy. our children to grow up to be secure, healthy, happy adults. But how much do we understand about how that actually happens? The brain research has told us a lot about this that we didn't know. But now we have over a decade of brain research that says early experiences really do make a difference in the long-term outcomes for the child and the adult. 
I think for a long time there was a bias that um, in the education world that your IQ was going to determine your success in school. And I think both in schools and in businesses now, people are looking back and saying maybe those are not the things that make you most successful. Maybe uh, success has a lot to do with how you relate to people uh, and things like trustworthiness and conscientiousness. We learned that those first three years of life are tremendously important. That what we learn then tends to stick with us. It gets into our limbic systems, which is a part of the brain that's deep down in our midbrains. And uh, we're often not aware of that. Uh, and that it is very important in terms of our decision making, the way we treat other people, what we learn about ourselves, what we learn about the world around us. Those are learned in the first three years of life, for which there's no verbal reasoning available. Knowing this, wouldn't we want to do everything in our power to support parents during the first years of their children's lives? When you talk about early childhood, you know, one of the challenges is that it's, it's very easy to get lost in how cute those little kids look. Uh, everybody wants to help them, uh, but we don't get serious about what investments uh, are going to cost. And the flip side is that if we don't invest, uh, we're going to be paying now, and guess what? We're going to be paying forever. In this KMT special report, we're going to explore why social and emotional development is so important in the early years of life. We'll look at the impact of trauma and toxic stress and learn how Kentucky families are supporting parents to be the best they can be. Cesarean section at Louisville Center for Women and Infants. Despite the surgical environment, the baby is placed on the mother's chest for what is known as kangaroo care. This practice promotes breastfeeding and temperature control in newborns, but it also has profound emotional effects on both mother and baby, rooted in biology. The evidence shows that the closer you are to your baby, the more oxytocin your brain develops, and it's known as the love hormone. It's what makes you fall in love. While the mother is in recovery from surgery, the father continues kangaroo care with the encouragement of staff. Meanwhile, in the neonatal intensive care unit, a mother has her twins in kangaroo care. Someone seeing this might say, well, of course I love my baby. No, you don't even know your baby when it's born. And some women feel uncomfortable because they don't fall in love right away. And they think, oh my God, there must be something wrong with me. And it isn't. So we really want to encourage moms to be as close to their babies as they possibly can. People who had puppies or kittens know that you know the, the babies are always piled up on one another in, in a pile, and they always have another warm body next to them. And I think we as humans have sort of gotten away from that. This is the way it's just hold the baby over your hand. Sure, the people will be the As director of the newborn nursery, Dr. Wasser and his team spend a lot of time poking and prodding infants in ways they clearly don't appreciate. But as a former student of the famous pediatrician T. Barry Brazelton, author of What Every Baby Knows, he understands the emotional needs of an infant well. One thing I've learned all about babies is we are programmed to be interested in looking at faces. And people have done studies uh, called infant regard studies where they hold two pictures up in front of a baby and they just watch where the baby spend more time looking. And babies spend much more time looking at pictures that look like faces. Even if it's just a circle with two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, they will spend more time looking at that than some random picture. Even if it's the same visual elements just kind of mixed up so they don't look like a face anymore. 
Dr. Wasser visits with each mother and reminds them of the importance of face-to-face -face interaction and responding to their baby's needs. In the first three to four or five months of life, babies are learning how to communicate with other people. And so when he's awake and looking around, I want you to be in his face, okay? Talk to him, make contact. He'll start to run back and forth. He'll learn to take turns in conversation. That's how babies learn how to do that. And it's important for you to be doing that with him. When parents leave the hospital, they are given a mobility wrap, which further encourages close physical contact during the course of the day. The emphasis on attachment and bonding is about more than temporary good feelings from mom and baby. It's about brain development and creating a secure foundation for growth. There was a whole generation of people who grew up being told that you shouldn't hold your children, you shouldn't pick them up when they cry, you would spoil them. And what behaviorists have found out is the child that's not picked up, the child that's not held, is a child that's more likely to have developmental and behavioral issues down the line. So the message for early parenting is that you want your baby to think that if they call for help, you're going to be there. So when they call early on in pride, you need to respond. Two, at one, two, three months of this is not the time to let a baby cry out. Trust is really what those babies are learning, and you want them to trust that you will be there to help. The research about attachment began in the 1950s. At the time, current child rearing experts cautioned parents against holding children because it would make them weak. Let me show you a monkey raised on a nursing wire mother. Researcher Harry Harlow of the University of Wisconsin countered that argument with his famous monkey studies. He took the monkeys away from their mothers hours after birth and gave them the option of a wire mother with a bottle or a cloth mother. They spent nearly all their time with the cloth mother. If stressed, they ran to the cloth mother. Those that he paired with no mother at all, wire or cloth, became deeply disturbed and unable to connect with their environment. In recent years, this research has been supported by the latest findings on brain development. Dr. Otto Cake, Associate Director of the Center for Trauma and Children at the University of Kentucky, is an expert on the importance of brain development in early childhood. It's the most complicated three pounds of matter on Earth. The way it gets organized is there's a genetic basis for it, but the, the fine-tuning is all from experience. Every second, a child under two years of age is growing two billion neural connections in their brain. There's a phrase that's used, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together, so that when you have a synapse, word, which is where neurons connect with one another, uh, if that connection is made between a smile and a pleasant experience, then they learn to associate, I must be okay, the world is okay, and that begins to get hardwired in their brains then. Whereas if, they, if that's an inconsistent kind of response, sometimes I frown, sometimes I smile. If it's a little bit inconsistent, that's all right. But if it's very inconsistent, then that's bad for their development. So for, the, for example, parents who are supposed to be the sources of nurturing and caring for a child, if they're not, then that child learns to not expect the world to treat them well, to learn to expect to be treated poorly and badly. And it's like building a house on the sand where the foundation is not good. And then anything you build on top of that, it comes crashing down. Attachment literally provides for the foundation for proper brain development. Unfortunately, for many reasons, problems with attachment are alarmingly common. In terms of attachment, 60% of parents are raising children who are securely attached, which means it's a great boon for their future mental health and emotional and physical health. But uh, about 40% of parents are not doing a good enough job. We're raising children who are insecurely attached, and that means lots of problems later on in their development. And for some children, attachment issues are just the beginning of their problems. The year is 1985. The location, Kaiser Permanente Medical Care Program in San Diego. Dr. Vincent Ferretti, the medical director of a large program designed to help obese patients lose weight, is facing a puzzling problem. Just when many of his patients have begun to lose a noticeable amount of weight, they drop out of the program. 
He decides to meet with patients one-on-one -on -one to determine why. The answers are startling. He discovers that many of his patients had been sexually abused as children, and he realizes that for some of his patients, excess eating and weight gain are not simply a matter of lack of control or education. They are, in fact, a protective mechanism and a way of coping with the bad experiences from their past. After partnering with Dr. Robert Anda at the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Ferlito's investigation was expanded to cover 17,000 largely middle-class adult patients in the Kaiser Permanente system. The survey asked them about their history with 10 different potentially adverse childhood experiences, known as ACEs, grouped in three categories. Abuse, physical, emotional, sexual. Neglect, physical and emotional. And household dysfunction, mental illness, incarcerated household member, a mother who was treated violently, substance abuse, and divorce. For each type of adverse childhood experience, the person was given a point, and the points were tallied. For instance, a person whose parents were divorced and whose father was incarcerated and suffered from addiction received an ACE score of 30. Again, the researchers could not believe what they found. 67% had at least one ACE. Over 20% had three or more ACEs. 11% experienced five or more categories. The researchers determined that higher ACE scores correlated with an increase in risk for problems like substance abuse, smoking, and depression. And also for physical health problems like cancer, diabetes, stroke, and heart disease. And here's the most surprising part. Adverse childhood experiences make a person more susceptible to adult diseases, regardless of coping behaviors like smoking or substance abuse. Preventing disease, then, goes beyond exercising, eating right, and getting good medical care. It means reducing adverse childhood experiences. So it was really a dramatic finding, one, that they were so prevalent, and two, that they had such a direct impact on uh, outcomes later in life. And what exactly causes these ACEs to impact health later in life? Well, we think the mechanism is related to chronic stress and what's now called toxic stress. But, uh, not all stress is bad, but toxic stress is where it is extreme or persistent um, or severe enough that, that your body it never re recovers from that initial stress response. Biologically, what happens is that we are able to do things in crisis that we're not able to do when we're not in crisis. Um, so all of our uh, muscles, all of our brain chemistry, all of the functioning of the body is always alert. And that puts an incredible amount of stress on the organs, on the psyche, on my ability to think, my ability to concentrate beyond just surviving and managing the crisis. And what we're learning is that there's a lot of chronic illnesses that are related to the living on the toxic stress especially domestic violence uh, has been one of the symptoms cited for that. Um, and therefore, when people have uh, immune disorders and when they have chronic pain, a lot of physicians have been invited and encouraged to ask about a history of domestic violence or child abuse. I think the uh, ACEs study uh, is a game changer, uh, truly a game changer for Kentucky and for every state. Uh, to me, what the ACEs study does is it puts research and numbers behind common sense. According to the National Survey of Children's Health, more children experience three or more adverse child experiences during their first eight years in Kentucky than any state in the country besides Montana. The cost of not addressing these adverse childhood experiences early in life is huge. Even if you just look at toxic stress and what happens in early school age, again, the kids that can't pay attention, maybe because they're suffering toxic stress from their home environment. And those kids are going to fail. They're going to fail grades in school. They're going to drop out of school early. People that never develop this skill of relationships begin to feel isolation. They don't have any close friends. And those are the kids, if you look at the school shootings that have happened around the country, many times that's a factor in those. People desperately need a sense of belonging. And if they don't get that from proper social and emotional development growing up, and those are the kids that seek out gangs later in life. I think the average childhood experiences study tells us that risky behaviors like using alcohol, using drugs, 
particularly IV drug use. You know, those studies indicate that 80% of IV drug use can be attributed to adverse childhood experience. So the importance of working on those early on is really, really critical because obviously we all know that remediation is really, really difficult. Once children get into those behavior patterns, it's very difficult to turn them around. And once adults are in those behavior patterns, then what do they model for the next generation? In Dr. Felitti's words, improving parenting skills across the nation may well be the most important public health advancement of our time. One place to see the impact of both childhood adversity and the need for parenting support and education is in our state prisons and detention centers. At the Mason County Detention Center, Cooperative Extension Program Assistant Angie Mitchell offers a parenting class called Nurturing Fathers to men enrolled in a substance abuse recovery program there. Currently, the state houses over 20,000 inmates. Over 27,000 children in Kentucky have a parent who is incarcerated. Part of our mission through Cooperative Extension is to take research-based education to the community at the grassroots level. And I got to thinking about parenting classes, and I thought, what a better place to take them than to the detention center. First session when we met, we talked about the roots of fathering. And I want to kind of revisit that. My father was, uh, he was really abusive. Um, so that's what, that's how I knew he was around. If I wasn't, you know, if he wasn't abusing me or my mom, I didn't really know he was around. Learned a lot about drugs from my dad. I didn't learn anything really from him. I was afraid of him up until a certain point when I couldn't take no more. And then, you know, I turned with, he taught me against him and used it against him. That's kind of what we want to pull out, the roots. Um, because... What we know is that most of us parent the way that we were parented, unless we make a conscious choice to change that. My mother, she raised four kids on her own. And like, she was our mother and father. Like she never did no good, none. So she really showed us what she can. And as a, being a mother and a father. So it was like kind of hard really learning the the father part of the situation because she worked a lot, she did a lot of things, so it was like really stuck. You feel me? Like, so I don't want to never put my kids in that situation where they don't learn. This because not learning got me basically here. Many of the men in the group reported they were abused or neglected in some way as children. As we just heard, for some, neglect was the result of parents having to work too much to support the family. Was there another father figure in your life who maybe you took some things from? I, I finally got like a, I'm, I ain't gonna say, I'm gonna say a role model. I finally got that when I was like nine or 10. But I had my mother boyfriend that became her husband. He was there a lot, showed us a lot of things, but but by that time it was like a little too late for her because by then we were making our own choices. I have a, what was called, I guess they're called church parents, you know what I mean? And uh, eventually after the, the rough childhood I had came to, you know, they took me out of the out of a place I was at and they started raising me. And I learned a lot from him. That's who I consider my dad now. Anything I need, I can call him. Any wrong I've done, they still stand by my side, and they know that you know, I can I can be a better person. Well, let's talk about for just a minute some barriers to being a nurturing father. We talked about one of the barriers earlier when we were talking about feelings, and that would be anger. Anger is a huge barrier to being a nurturing parent. I had a, a very bad anger problem with it. And it just kept me in jail. Yeah, I mean, it really destroyed my life. I really ain't in life yet. I mean, but now that coming through your program, other program, I mean, I really found myself. Like, this is the first time I really ever felt happy. Like, I don't know how to express it, but. This is the first time ever my life I felt happy because I really felt the person that in 
we've had in the way for years. So many participants in the class have low self-esteem and once they're in a class and they get revealing what's happened and they hear what's happened to other people in their life, that they realize that they're not alone and that they they have an alternative now and it really bolsters their self-esteem when they can come out and actually become a good parent. And, and the reward for that is not just for them, it's for us as a society because once they teach good parenting skills, their children will have those. And their children's children will have them. When I first began working in the detention center, I think when I came in, I brought with me some stereotypical judgments of who these men were as far as wondering if they wanted to do better with their lives. But what's really surprised me throughout these years is when I come in here, I see men who genuinely love their children and care about their families. And they do want to do better. This is a motivation book I made. This is a sobriety poster. It's uh, got the pictures of my kids on it and uh, the date that I became sober. I wish it, it, to, to help people that are coming out, they really want to try and, and to be productive citizens of society and, and, and to be that good parent. Forgiveness. I think we, we have to learn to forgive. Nearly all parents start off with the best intentions. It's incomprehensible to a mother who's holding a newborn baby that she would ever, ever do anything to hurt her baby or ever allow anyone else to do anything that would hurt her baby. I think it's really important, and it's a subject that we just don't talk about as a society, and that's the frustration that comes with being a parent. No licensing exam for becoming a parent. And uh, you don't have to be qualified. Uh, we all know how babies are made, and that's all you really have to do in order to become a parent. And learning to be a better parent is not something that, that just comes naturally. You know, parenting is not easy. It's, it's really one of the hardest jobs ever. There's lots of information on the Internet, but a lot of it's contradictory, and who do they talk to, and what do they believe. All those things are, make it more difficult, I think, for parents these days. In Clark County, Hannah's home visitor Crystal Wallen arrives for her weekly visit with the Fallen family. HANS, which stands for Health Access Nurturing Development Services, operates in all of Kentucky's 120 counties, supporting parents with research-based information, particularly about attachment and social and emotional development. Oftentimes when we have babies, people are so helpful to us about feeding babies or changing babies or holding babies. No one really is out there telling us how to help our babies to be emotionally strong and healthy. So that is kind of the cornerstone or, or the flagship of, of what we work on. Because what we know is we can create babies that are emotionally healthy. The rest of it comes. Because I didn't know really what attachment really was with kids. I never really uh, had any bonds with other children. You know, I never really was great with kids. So when I had mine, you know, when Trayvon was first born, I didn't really have much of an attachment to them. I didn't, I didn't know how to really connect with them or I was more nervous than anything. And then, you know, pain to tell you, know, everything you do with them, like, as long as it's a positive thing. You know, it's like, you know, tell them it's okay when they're crying or, you know, helping them through an issue, you know. That's all attachment. Yeah, well, this one is totally different, yeah. I'm immediately, you know, you know, trying to get to the knees before sometimes long it up. The program also helps families create a vision for their children and family life. She helped us a lot with having good communication with one another. We would talk about what we wanted for Wyatt in the future, um, our goals. I loved when we would set goals for him. Um, I think a big one we did was the pacifier, getting rid of the pacifier. So that, you know, I mean, we started with really small steps so we knew that we would be able to accomplish the goal. How are you? Hands home visitors generally try to see families on a weekly basis. Um, we are real clear that the more frequent our visits are and more regular our visits are, the better our outcomes are. And we take in a curriculum with us. So we're, we're all going in sharing the same information. So we know that families are getting quality research-based information. Uh, the 
there was a, an article in the Washington Post that said home visitation is um, preschool in its earliest form. And I love that because really what we're doing is we're taking information out to the parent and helping them to be their child's first teacher and make a difference in those first three years. Biggest thing that I've learned from Han is probably the brain development side of it. You know, I never realized how many different aspects, you know, how many different things in their environment actually affect their brain. Part of the brain development, uh, if you don't do a lot with them, they don't really get those really, really good connections. Like they gave us a little, like a little, I guess they're called little brain balls. I guess they're called, and they show one with like that, like stimulated yeah, brain. stimulated brain and unstimulated brain, like all the big connections and stuff like that, which I think is great because, I mean, that's one thing I want to do right, you know, is like get them smart, you know, get them, you know, doing good in school and going to college and stuff. I want to, what we can do now while they're little is, like, one of the most important things. One of the things that's most important to us as Pan's home visitors is our strength-based bullying, is that um, part of that core training that home visitors go through is that we talk with new home visitors a lot about seeing families and what their strengths are. Tell me how a normal day or routine looks for you and me. Um, and because of that strength-based perspective, we get, we're real clear that it's not our job to go in and tell parents what to do and how to behave and how to live their lives. Um, and that doesn't change parenting. What changes things for people is encouraging them to think differently. I first came involved with him when, while I was pregnant at the health department. My concerns were um, how I was going to manage going to high school and then taking care of her. It's helped me a lot. I've learned how to um, like manage my stress a lot. It's helped me um, when she's stressful, how to help her, um, putting myself in her shoes, like her terrible shoes. We would be at the store and then she would want something, how to manage that by giving her um, food before we leave, telling her exactly what we're going to do at the store, what to expect, and that way she would be prepared for it and I wouldn't have you know, her throwing herself on the floor while we were there. Um, and it's just helped me you know, look at situations differently. Like when I was little, I would, I would get spanked and stuff like that, and you know, I would feel bad that my mom would listen to me. While spanking has always been a commonly used child rearing technique, Experts are pushing for a new norm. I think in terms of spanking, we need to each promise ourselves to never, ever spank our children. And then we'll do it just about enough. Okay? But I think we need to have an ideal that says, that, that's, that's abusive. If I hit you, I'd be accused of battery and I'd go in court and you'd sue me and all that stuff. I'd be out with a child. Some kid parents tell me, well, you know, I don't. My child, I just spank them. I just touch them on the bottom. I don't really hurt. Okay, well, he's a three year old turns to you after you just touched them on the bottom and says, That didn't hurt. Well, what are you going to do then? You're going to have to hit them harder. You're going to get your belt out. You're going to lose your temper. And that, this is how kids get, get hurt. And so I think we have to remove physical punishment as our paradigm. Of discipline. And again, I'm not saying don't discipline a child. That's not what I'm saying. Childs need discipline, but they don't need physical punishment. By providing parents with child development knowledge and specific strategies for handling behavioral issues, Hannah is helping parents to set limits in more effective and nurturing ways. We really try to talk with parents about the difference between discipline versus punishment. And there's two completely different definitions when you really think about it. You know, most of us want disciplined children, right? Children that are able to self-regulate, that have appropriate behaviors, that understand the difference between right and wrong. That's what we call a disciplined child. A punished child is more of the child who um, receives a punishment, a spanking, a loss of privilege. Sometimes we be disciplined or punished, like our own parents did. When I was little, you know, you know, picking out a switch from the you know, the tree and coming in. We had a fiddle. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah. dad would take it right off. Exactly. <laughs> it was it. Whatever they had handy, you know. We but, didn't do that. Yeah, now that I'm a, a, a parent, I'm like, that was a little much. I didn't know that stress causes a baby's brain to kind of just shut off. So when they're under stressful situations, like a lot of yelling and fighting, like it's really bad for the brain. I did not know that. On a statewide level, 
we do compare families that are in hands with families that are not participating in hands. And what we have found over the years is really very good results. We've seen less uh, low birth weight infants, less prematurity, less infant mortality. We also see less ER usage, less substantiated abuse and neglect. Um, and we also see improved education, and we've also seen an improvement in child development knowledge. The, uh, a baby enjoy the interaction with their parent and know that, that they are really getting the support that they need in growing. You know, it's a beautiful thing. I think that every parent can use this second pair of hands. We like to say that in our program. And, you know, I think as parents, we all have stress and we all have burdens and we could all, you know, um, use this extra support. Parent to peer support is another important way that parents can learn about child development and parenting techniques. At the Portland Promise Center in Louisville, moms come for a weekly Mother's Day in group where they do crafts, share a meal, and talk about parenting challenges. So we've talked about before about having like conversations about potty training and behavior issues. I think maybe that was pretty nice and, and nice to have a break. I especially know that we're having four kids, but um, I think I like the fact that the parents are hands-on with their kids while they're here. Just having that, that one on one time to learn whether it's the activity or the craft that we're doing. Having a time here and having that socialization and that play time together is really important. I know that for me that um, parent support and having a peer group is, um, was really supportive for me and really helpful for me. Um, after I had my twins, I was really depressed and, and upset about it because I was completely life changing. Um, and I had a group of friends that came in and met with me once a week, and, you know, we ate and we talked and we discussed and invented whatever was going on with our children. The group is part of a pilot initiative sponsored by the Metro United Way in the Louisville area that is helping families get their children ready for kindergarten. Only 33% of children in the Portland area are kindergarten ready. 52.3% of children in the entire county are considered kindergarten ready. The initiative utilizes a unique parent-friendly screening tool called Ages and Stages Questionnaires. The Ages and Stages Questionnaire is a series of 21 different questionnaires that are to be completed by a parent, and they show the parent the different activities that they can be doing with the child and show if the child is on track compared to their peers. Um, the questionnaires are age-specific, so each child gets the specific questionnaire that's for their specific age range and their milestones. Once it's completed, it comes back to Metro United Way, and we score it and find out if the parent has any concerns or if there are any areas of concerns that are show up on the ages and stages. Hi, this is Kimberly calling for Metro United Way. Just wanted to follow up with you. I've just got the ages and stages questionnaire for your daughter. After it is scored, Kimberly makes contact with those parents who have a concern and makes referrals to outside agencies for intervention, like First Steps. She also sends out activity ideas and books to every parent who is enrolled. Anyone in the Metro Louisville area can access this service, but special outreach efforts are made in low-income communities. At the Mother's Day in-group, parent leader Mary Jolly passes out and collects the questionnaires as needed. She's also there to provide one-on-one -on -one support as necessary. In this neighborhood, sometimes people will have a hard time reading and understanding. Um, and I know that, um, that it can be kind of challenging and it can be kind of frustrating. So uh, if that's the case, they can call me and I can come and help them sit down and go through it with their child. I don't think parents would know uh, the information um, of how to get their kids ready for kindergarten and how to get their kids ready for school without the questionnaire. A few miles away, another Ages and Stages community group gathers. We create environments with this questionnaire where we have these, what we call birthday parties. In various neighborhoods, and we bring the families together. We have food, we have uh, community partners come in and educate parents about different resources that are in the community. So we use that space to create a learning environment as well, all centered around the ages and stages. 
by creative spaces, we believe that the parents, when they know better, they do better, and that each and every single parent that comes into that space has something to contribute, a wealth of knowledge. The parents' response to being part of the Asian and States community has been one of, first there's some suspicion, what is this questionnaire, who's this knocking at my door, I want to create community. But once they administer the questionnaire themselves, it starts to break down the complexity of what child development looks like. If I make this circle right here, the aha moments are really amazing to see. So when parents come to this epiphany that their child is able to use scissors, that their child uh, is crawling on time, you know, and, and then uh, parents that have barriers for their children to reach toward development are very ecstatic about getting those resources in advance and, and really getting in there and starting to remedy those uh, complications. Your ice is cold. What is five? Right. Okay. Shelton believes the Ages and Stages questionnaire helps with reducing stress as well. If a parent has certain expectations for a child, if those aren't in line with developmental uh, milestones that children can actually reach, um, you can see how that can be in conflict with their social emotions. Our community that we create with the families is uh, one that we are always engaging about healthy disciplinary practices, uh, whether we're role modeling in that environment ourselves to produce uh, just a really healthy uh, spirit. For families who are enrolled in the Ages and Stages Questionnaires program through these special outreach efforts, the benefits are already apparent. 65% of the children whose ASQ scores reveal the delay are connected with the special help and services they need. My hope for this is more and more children will begin to be ready for kindergarten. My hope is that um, every family knows where to turn when they have a concern. And their concern is either validated or they're connected to the right service. We want to look at the whole family and make sure that the whole family has the stability they need. Nearly 50% of children in Kentucky are in some form of daycare or preschool. What is the role of caregivers in these settings in fostering secure attachments and addressing early childhood mental health issues? Teachers who are dealing with kids who grew up with insecure attachments, they see symptoms. They see symptoms of hyperactivity. They see kids who don't care about other kids, who have no empathy, who misbehave all the time, who love to get attention by pulling somebody else's pigtails, uh, that kind of thing. And they, what they tend to do then is they tend to treat symptoms and say this kid is ADHD or this kid is a conduct disorder kid or this kid has oppositional compliance disorder. And then they send them to psychiatrists who say, ah, yes, you're right, and they give them drugs, never understanding the cause of this child's symptoms. At the Growing Together Preschool in Lexington, Noah Middleton is a happy and self-regulated child who plays well with others. Looking at him today, it's difficult to imagine that he was on the verge of expulsion due to problem behaviors. When um, Noah came into my classroom in May, I knew right off the bat that there was behavioral problems. It was, it was biting at first. There was, there was a lot of biting. But it wasn't just fighting. There were, in several times, he had he had problems sitting still. He was very busy. He crawled. Um, just to touch his friends. He continued this. We we could not stop it. Um, the distraction was getting to the point where we had to stop the circle. We were starting to get parent complaints as well, and the parents knew the child's name and would request that their child not be placed in the classroom or that the child that Noah be removed from the school. Every day when I would pick him up, I would get these sad don't about my child 
and how much worse he was than anyone else, and it was very emotional. <laughs> On the advice of a friend who was a social worker, Stacy and her husband sought help from Christy Lieber, a licensed therapist who specializes in parent-child interaction therapy known as PCIT. It is different from the traditional therapy in which um, parents will bring their child to the office, the child walks back to the office, but the therapist spends an hour, is 100% compliant, perfectly behaved, um, goes back out with the parent to the waiting room, they, they leave the office and go home, and the parent knows very little about what's going on uh, behind that closed therapy door. Um, with PCIT, we bring the parent in as a vital um, component to the treatment team. And we actually teach them the therapeutic skills that we would use with their child. I'm getting in you. You are getting in the blue truck. In PCIT, the therapist literally coaches the parent through what is called special playtime, giving them the words to say. Thank you for including me in the playing Initially, the sessions are entirely child-led. The parent is encouraged to praise, reflect, imitate, describe, and show enthusiasm during the interaction. The fact that the child is allowed to direct the play is just um, so vital that they have the opportunity um, to just be themselves. And I think even more importantly, to give freedom to the parents to not worry about teaching, to not worry about correcting, to just get on the floor, just be with their child, be present and available, and and enjoy and share the light is a tangible thing that, that the children and parents need to experience together. It helps their self-esteem. It lets them know that they have a caregiver who is so vested in them as a person and values what they're interested in. And it fosters, again, ultimately that secure attachment relationship, which is the number one predictor for success for kids. Thank you for sharing with me. For you, I would say that that thing about PCIT is that it is something you can easily take home and practice on a regular basis and that you see immediate results with the relationship that you have with your child. I was very skeptical at first because for the first several weeks we only talked about describing his behaviors and praising him while we were playing and all those things to me didn't seem like it could have that much of an effect. But the undivided attention that he was getting on a regular basis while we were having special playtime was enough to create a much stronger bond between him and me and also between um, he and his dad and between myself and my husband. Because we were working as a team to try to praise him more often and give him that undivided attention that is so hard to give in, in our busy society. Did special time? The school also implemented PCIT with the help of Christy Lever and the local comprehensive care center. You found the big plastic toy. You found the big plastic toy. You are checking out everything it can do. You are checking out everything it can do. When I first heard about PCIT, you are trying to I thought, it's simple enough, and it, I, I believe it would work for your average kid, but not Noah. There's no way that this is going to help him. But every day the teachers would pull out Noah for special playtime. So we're going to do it, we're going to follow it, and um, we're going to stick with it. We're not going to stop, even if I don't believe it, that it's going to help. We're not going to stop. Well, um, two weeks go by, and I'm like, wow, you know what? I haven't wrote. I haven't written another book. I haven't done any observations. Uh, there's been no instance, and who has been any book? After six weeks, there were still no incidents. His problem behaviors were all but gone. And he sees, he sees me smile. When he sees me smile, he wants to keep... And he's smiling. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to hear no, don't, stop. We're adults. We don't want to hear that. The therapy also includes coaching on what to do when the child does not comply. You may choose one thing or you may or you won't be allowed to bring anything.
he will follow through with my plan 90% of the time now, which has taken a huge burden off of all of us because he doesn't act out in a physical manner um, on any sort of regular basis. And we know that if we need him to follow a direction, then he will do it because we give him the two choices. And he either follows through or I know what to do if he doesn't because it's very clear to me what my next step is if he doesn't follow our commands immediately. The best advice I can give to any parent who is struggling with any sort of behavioral issue with their child is to get help and do it right away. Because there are therapies, PCIT is a really good example, that you can do with children who are two, three, four years old before it gets to be a really bad habit. In Kentucky, 20% of children are said to have had a mental health condition at some point in their life. Would the more widespread use of therapies like this change that statistic? I um, have been working in the field for about a decade, and I've worked with um, over a couple hundred families using PCRT as the, the main intervention. And um, among those couple hundreds of families, after PCRT, um, we were able to um, resolve behavioral issues, relational issues, um, and emotional issues to the point where um, parents were satisfied and very content with where, how their children were functioning at that point. And they no longer uh, met criteria for any kind of behavior uh, disorder, according to the DSM. Um, only approximately, well, in fact, only about four of those were referred to psychiat psychiatry for a psychiatric evaluation post PCIT treatment. Um, so it's a fantastic uh, differential diagnostic tool as well. And I would urge all professionals working in early intervention to use that first before potentially referring for unnecessary and, and I'll even say sometimes harmful medication. One of the most difficult situations a parent will ever face is the possible removal of a child from their home by the state for suspected abuse or neglect. In Ashland, Amy Rogers and Kathy Moore work for Child Protective Services, assisting in cases where parents are brought into the system due to substance issues. Amy and Kathy both know the heartache of this experience personally. They both lost custody of their children for a period due to their addiction. And my addiction impacted me being a mother, like emotionally. I wasn't there emotionally for them. Uh, there for a long time, I was a functioning alcoholic and addict. I worked and had a job, and I loved my children. But no matter how much I loved my children, that drug was so strong that, you know, that addiction was so strong, I had to get the next one. We have no clue as to what our problem is. We don't know why we can't stop. We don't know why all this stuff has happened. And it's... Um, being in that state of confusion, day in and day out, it's, it's very painful, it's very resentful, it's, um, it's just a real dark place that, that parents go. My experience with CPS was like, I felt like they didn't understand that they were just there to take my kids and they didn't want me to have my kids back. And uh, it was just, it was a really scary experience. Now in long-term recovery and reunited with their children, Amy and Kathy are both employed as family mentors with the START program, which stands for Sobriety, Treatment, and Recovery Team. START represents a new way of doing business for Child Protective Services when it comes to cases involving substance abuse. Historically, in Child Protection Services, we would deal with substance abuse the best way we know how. We didn't have great collaborative relationships with the substance abuse treatment providers in the community. And as child welfare workers, oftentimes we didn't know a lot about addiction ourselves. Um, we focused on the child a lot. And so oftentimes the concern was the child's unsafe. So oftentimes the child would be ready to go to a foster home or to a relative placement so that we could work with the parent. Safety is first, but it's a real balancing act. You have to consider what's more traumatic. And is there a way we can make the family at home safer? without removing the child from everything they've always known, which can be damaging on so many levels to the child. In the START model, every effort is made to maintain the parent-child bond and community connection. 
a comprehensive treatment team that involves both CPS staff and staff from the addiction treatment program wraps around the parent once they enter the system and provides treatment immediately in order to maximize the chance of success. It's not unusual in Kentucky for families to have to wait for months to get their behavioral health services. But in START, once we receive a family in START, we can usually get them in substance use treatment services within 48 hours. Perhaps one of the most innovative aspects of this program is the use of family mentors like Amy and Kathy. They are people who successfully maneuvered all of those different systems that all of our clients generally face um, and carry the basically the story of hope and that things are possible. Are you better with your parents that your family them and they're supervising and everything? They help so much in the engagement of families that we're working with because, you know, no one wants to hear from a college graduate that they're not taking care of their kids. We had a meeting this morning with one of our clients. Getting to work with Amy and Kathy as family mentors every day is really enlightening that you know you see what recovery is about just the journeys that they've had and the barriers that they've overcome which i think they're amazing and um, that they're willing to give so much of themselves i realize what the social workers face is to you know having to take somebody's children or you know it's they don't want to do that they want to keep the children with their families and my wrong thinking was that they were the enemy when they are there to work beside you. All right. One of the program's biggest fans is District Court Judge Scott Reese. Prior to start, the only information he had to make a ruling regarding custody was the recommendation of a sole social worker. I feel a whole lot better because now I have not only just their caseworker, their cabinet worker, but the whole STAR team, which consists of numerous individuals that have watched, they've been into the home, they've interviewed the family, they've talked to the kids, they've uh, uh, put in place uh, substance abuse counseling, group counseling, uh, family counseling, and there's so many more, I guess, eyes on the family that says, hey, you know, we agree it's safe to return this child home. When I have all those professionals that are in that home working with this family, I'm a whole lot more comfortable with that decision. I'd love to have all my uh, neglect and abuse cases to have that many resources in that family. Obviously, that's a, a financial you know, uh, issue that, that we just don't have. But the start docket gives me that with these high-risk families. The real testimony to the impact of the program are the numbers. Sobriety rates for women in START are almost 70%, almost double that of parents not in START. Children in START are 50% less likely to enter foster care. Stacy and James Pennington are a START success story. They now live in Louisville with their young son, who was born after they graduated from START. They came into the system after their addiction to prescription pain medicine spiraled out of control. Their older daughter was placed with family members. They were initially referred for outpatient treatment. Recovery was difficult at first. You get to the point where you feel like death is a better option than recovery. That, I mean, that, that's where I was for me. It, it felt a whole lot easier. You know, you, you just, when you're in the grips of addiction like that, you can't see it being any better. The family mentor pushed for them to go to long-term treatment in Louisville at the healing place. She very strongly recommended it, and as much as we kept fighting, not wanting to do it, she didn't even give up on it. She would just pop in every day, and unexpected, and be like, oh, are you guys ready to go? For me, it was being able to relate with somebody that, that might have known what I was going through. Um, that, that was one of the biggest things that I couldn't say you don't understand what we're going through. Stacy and James now both have jobs in addiction recovery services. They are continuing to seek custody of their daughter while they raise their young son. I'm blessed with, with my job where I get to try to help someone and to let someone know that it's possible and that it can work for them because somebody you know, the START program did that for me. That just gives me 
a purpose, I guess, and it helps keep me sober. It takes a whole lot to, to recover from a hopeless state. But it's so much worth it. March should be three years since, since we've had a drink or a drug or, or we've lived a bad life. And, and the benefits that we're reaping from it today, the things that our children get from it today, that we as a couple get from it, you know, it's, it's something we share together. For me personally, it is absolutely rewarding to see Kentucky adopt this program, to see child protective service workers and mentors liking their job and enjoying the idea of actually being able to work with this difficult population of families. It's rewarding to see the system change and for practices in general to change. And at the end of the day, there's nothing better than seeing a family who is reunified, healthy, and in recovery. As we close this program, it's important to remember that as challenging as parenting is, it's that much more stressful for parents struggling financially. By some measures, half of the Kentucky families are considered low income. Think about what it takes to make it as a family every day. Issues of housing and utilities, groceries and transportation, child care. Every one of those dimensions gets harder and harder for low-income families. There have been measures in childhood of the levels of stress hormones in children who live in poverty as opposed to children who are not living in poverty, and they're higher. It really does call upon everybody in Kentucky to make a difference. There is no way we can even begin to attack poverty without elected leaders in Frankfurt taking action. By the same token, uh, I have a, a really strong belief that, that a number of the ACEs factors get solved in faith communities, in extended families, through neighborhood organizations. I think we need to look at who we are as a community and how do we take care of the most vulnerable among us. Culture changes all the time. Uh, we just need to be very intentful about what we need that culture change to be, develop the language and develop the critical mass of person at a time a family at a time, a community at a time, to say, not on my watch. Particularly in Kentucky, when we know our families face a lot of stresses, the more we can do to support families uh, that will help uh, develop social emotional competencies in our children, and in many cases break the cycles that have been going on for generations in some of these families, the better chances we have of having better health outcomes, better economic development, and better outcomes for Kentuckians in the future. video. Um, Kayla is back uh, with us and if you all have any questions or comments about about this documentary, um, she's here to answer those. You want to come on up? And there were so many programs I can't promise I'll have the answer but I have paper so I can write them down and if I get you the sure. answers I'm sure, sure there's a distribution list. What, it, what questions or comments do you all have from the field? Are there any? I do know from my program manager that um, you're able to show this video at your local health department if you need to. I'm still figuring out the logistics of how that works. I'm not sure if it will be you know, on a disc or okay. how it works, but okay. I can get you that information. Okay. I'll be glad to share that. that this the presentation may be something that you want to share with um, your community coalitions or you know your at your staff meetings um, so forth and so on yeah sure yes okay thank you so much oh, appreciate thanks. it all your help next on the agenda we're going to have Emily Atkins who is the program director for the title 10 family planning program uh, present an update and overview regarding the Family Planning Program Information and Education Advisory 
and community participation committee requirements. So Emily, if you want to come on up. And thank you for being with us today, Emily. Thank you, Joy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by just letting you know why we're going over the INE committee uh, process with you today. There, um, this is one issue that comes up repeatedly when we have site visits from the Office of Population Affairs. We, we always get um, a lot of suggestions on our process and um, I guess you could say we got dinged on it this past time because we got multiple suggestions and we had to respond to those. So this is one of our ways of, of responding to what the Office of Population Affairs would like for us to do. They want to make sure that we retrain uh, you on how this process is supposed to work. And I don't want you to get discouraged because I do feel like health departments are doing an excellent job with this. We have, it, it isn't an easy process. It's, it's, not, it's not difficult, but at the same time, it isn't, it isn't easy to find all the members that you need and get them to regularly participate in one of these committees. And that seems to be our, our biggest struggle. And we know that that's a struggle statewide. And for your uh, peace of mind, I think you should know that that's also a, a an issue that comes up nationally. It's not specific to Kentucky or to your health department to have issues trying to get this committee to work the way it should. Um, we do have some health departments that are doing an excellent job of it. Others are struggling more. Um, I've, there are some that aren't as aware of the process as they need to be. So if you have any questions aside from what I, I present today and you think that it's more in depth than what I can answer on ITV, please feel free to email me or call me. Um, I want you to know that the, there are two components to, to this. It's not specific. We always refer to it as the INE committee, but it's not specifically just the INE committee. There is a community participation piece and then an information and education committee piece. Um, we have traditionally in Kentucky combined those two because we, we have been instructed that that is a good and easy way to, to do that process. They can be done separately. But it is simpler if you keep those, those two things together. So I'm going to talk to you today about what those two separate things are and how we can make sure we meet that requirement when we put them together the way we do here. Um, starting off, go to our first slide here. I'm going to apologize right away because I'm going to read these guidelines to you. <laughs> it's the, or the regs, the regulations, the actual regulations that, that um, guide what we're doing here. And this is just so you know exactly what they say and why we're doing it. So um, these, these regulations, um, the way they're reading where it says 11.1, 11 and 11.1, .1, this is specifically the way they read in the newest Title X requirements that we received in April. Um, if you look at the old ones, they were 6.8 or something like that, so they will have different numbers just because they organize the um, the guidelines a little differently this time. And although I keep referring to them as guidelines, they are now calling them requirements, which is, I guess, a stronger term. So for um, community participation, the first piece, Title X grantees are expected to provide for community participation and education to promote the activities of the project. Title X grantees and subrecipient agencies, which would be you at the local health department, must provide an opportunity for participation in the development, implementation, and evaluation of the project by persons broadly representative of all significant elements of the population to be served and by persons in the community knowledgeable about the community's needs for family planning services. And as you can see in this um, slide, the CFRs are quoted throughout. So if you need to pull those up um, to read them for yourself, this is, those are the slides that they're taken from. And for those who have looked through the, the new requirements, you will see that that is how the requirements are organized now. They are organized more as CFRs and very little additional language in addition to those CFRs so that you can see that those are regulations. Projects must establish and implement planned activities to facilitate community awareness of and access to family planning services. Each family planning project must provide for community education programs. The community education programs should be based on an assessment of the needs of the community and should, should contain an implementation and evaluation strategy. Now, I don't worry as much about these community participation parts because 
I know that you all are doing this stuff anyway with all of your programs, and this is not specific to family planning. Community education should serve to enhance community understanding of the objectives of the project, make known the availability of services to potential clients, and encourage continued participation by persons to whom family planning may be beneficial. Now moving on to the I and E piece of the puzzle. <laughs> Information and educational materials approval. Um, I'd like to point out right away that um, for I and E review, for, for, and I will, I'll go over this again later, the community participation piece is an annual piece. It has to be done every year, and that's why we have the I and E committee meet every year and have meeting minutes so that we have documentation of that community piece. The INE piece is actually the education materials review, and that only has to, has to be done when new materials are coming out before they are used in your clinic. So um, obviously we don't have something to review every year, but you can review existing materials every year as part of this piece. Every project is responsible for reviewing and approving informational and educational materials. The Information and Education, i.e. Advisory Committee, may serve the community participation function if it meets the requirements or a separate group may be identified. So this is where it's telling you, you could do a separate group for your i &E and for your community, but that would require keeping up with two totally separate processes and it would probably be easier for everyone as to do as we've continued to do and to use that as one group so that if you have new materials, or you want to review those existing materials, you already have an existing group together to do that. Title 10 grantees and subrecipient agencies are required to have a review and approval process by an advisory committee of all informational and educational materials developed or made available under the project prior to their distribution. The committee must include individuals broadly representative in terms of, de of <laughs> demographic factors such as race, color, national origin, handicapped condition, sex, and age of the population, or community for which the materials are intended. Each Title X grantee must have an advisory committee of five to nine members, and I will tell you, we had some sites that had more than nine members, which I never saw as an issue, because to me, the more the better, <laughs> because it is so difficult to come up with your number of members, to me, having more is better. But that is not the way the Office of Population Affairs sees it, and we did get dinged for sites that had more than nine members on their committee. Um, they did refer me to Oregon's INE committee process, so I reviewed some materials that they had, and in their materials they did talk about trying to maintain nine, because if you, if you shoot for five and then somebody doesn't show up or won't participate, then you don't have enough to make the committee. So if you do try to shoot for nine, or close to nine, then you're, you're better to your number, but never try to get more than nine on your committee or you'll get things for that. <laughs> the advisory committee must review and approve all informational and educational materials developed or made available under the project prior to the distribution to assure that the materials are suitable for the population and the community for which they are intended and to assure their consistency with the purposes of Title X. The grantee may delegate INE functions for the review and approval of materials to subrecipient agencies. However, the oversight of the INE review process rests with the grantee. So we do have you all send in your minutes so that we can review them and, and make sure they're consistent. Um, we will probably be looking at those more closely in the future than we did in the past. Um, I will tell you that we looked in the past to trying to make a statewide committee rather than separate committees at each health department. But what we found is the um, diversity in populations from one end of the state to the other um, was going to make that process pretty difficult. In addition to that, um, we, we do want each community to have the ability to look at those materials and determine whether that's appropriate for their community. Um, also, because we so rarely have new materials to review, um, it was just going to be hard to maintain that type of committee um, statewide. So it, it makes more sense for us to have that at the local level. But I, I will say that we're always open to suggestions for new ideas. We do take those into consideration. So we, you know, we're not opposed to the idea of at some point moving to a statewide committee if that becomes more appropriate. 
The advisory committee may delegate responsibility for the review of the factual, technical, and clinical accuracy, accuracy to appropriate project staff. However, final responsibility for approval of the INE materials rests with the advisory committee. Um, and the reason that this one is important, and I'm going to address this again later, is because the, the um, committee is supposed to be um, individuals who are not staff members. And because we have so many on our staff that have that um, knowledge base, to review those materials for accuracy, it would have made sense to us to use those people on our committee. What they're saying is they're not allowed to be committee members, but they can review those materials for accuracy for the committee. So they can look at them and say this is correct or this isn't, so that, but they can't be considered committee members. And they can attend meetings, and I'll go into that more in a, in a, in a minute. Um, the INE Advisory Committee must consider the educational and cultural backgrounds of the in individuals to whom the materials are addressed, consider the standards of the population or community to be served with respect to such materials, review the content of the material to assure that the information is factually correct, determine whether the material is suitable for the population or community for which it is to be made available, and establish a written record of its determination. So that is, that is where the um, minutes come in that you send in to us. And I, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on that again in a minute. So what is the purpose of these, of these committees? The INE components, the INE Advisory Committee reviews, are to ensure that patient educational materials are appropriate and effective. The community participation component encourages community support and ensures that community needs are, be needs are being met. And as you can see, these things overlap quite a bit, and that's why we've tried not to separate them, but you do need to know there is a difference between the two, and the uh, responsibilities for each group are different, and that's why um, we, we have ours set up the way we do, because we want to combine those and make it as easy on you as possible. Um, so the INE Advisory Committee requirements must have five to nine members. You must have five. You cannot have more than nine. They must be broadly representative of the community. Um, they are to review and approve all family planning INE materials to assure that the materials are suitable for the target population and are consistent with Title X guidelines. So can you have an existing committee also serve as your INE committee? And the answer is yes. So some examples of this, and these, these examples specifically did come from Oregon. <laughs> so I want you to know that they may call their, their groups and committees differently than we do. So you may be able to look at this and think of committees that you have in your health department that are similar, that might match those types of descriptions or some other ideas or things that aren't on here. But the examples they gave were a public health advisory committee that you already have, a school-based clinic committee, or an alcohol and drug abuse prevention committee. You might want to create a subcommittee from one of those existing committees, especially if that, the main committee does not meet the needs. It may have some members who are staff members, or it may not have uh, a broad represent, representation, so you may have to add some members. Um, you may also want to use an existing committee group or organization that already represents your community. There may be um, a, a, another group in the community who's set up exactly like you need them to be for this, they're there to meet for some other purpose. Maybe you can talk to them about also reviewing these materials for you or serving as your um, community participation partner. So again, in-house agency staff cannot serve as committee members. And this, um, I will tell you, because I know you haven't been told that specifically in the past. I wasn't aware of that before our recent site visit. Um, but it has come to light, and we were informed that you cannot use your staff members. Um, now, we were not told whether or not if you had a staff member who was also the PTA president, if you couldn't have them listed on the committee as PTA president rather than whatever your health department is, those types of things. So there may be some ways to overlap it and not break the rules. Okay, community communication can be achieved through our committee communication. Now, this is specific to INE. So, with the INE committee, you don't have to have face-to-face -face meetings if you don't want to. Um, you can send materials out. Now, this is specifically for the review of materials. This is not for the community participation. To review those materials, you can send the materials out to um, 
to the participants by mail, email, or fax. Um, and you can have them fill out a review sheet and send it back to you without ever meeting in person. You can have face-to-face -face meetings and use that as your community participation piece, which is what we recommend. Um, you can also do a phone or teleconference, which also would count as your community participation piece if, that, if they are, you know, broadly representative of your community. Um, and, and, you know, just make sure you keep good minutes and document those and do it annually. Um, so the best, the best practices here are to provide each committee member with a cover letter that explains what the purpose of that committee is. Um, and what, they, what you expect them to do. Give them a copy of the materials to be reviewed and give them a review form with, with check boxes that they can go through and make sure that the things that you want met are met in those materials. Um, if you schedule face-to-face -face meetings for review of these materials, then you should provide those materials to the community partners prior to them coming so they have a chance to look over them and review them before they get there so that they're not feeling rushed to come up with the same answer as everyone else, that they can actually review through them and have uh, a true response to how they feel about those materials. The INE Advisory Committee feedback may determine whether you use uh, materials that you've created or revise materials that you've created or whether or not you're going to use purchased materials. So it, it works both ways. It's not just something that, that has been created, which, you know, our SPM 19 that we use um, is both purchased and created. We, we have a say in what is in that document. We get to review it and let Channing Beat know what changes we want made annually. So um, we try not to make major changes unless it's a consistent statewide um, thought or there's a change in policy or um, clinical guidelines. Otherwise, we will take into consideration your thoughts, and if enough people have the, a similar thought about what it needs to say or do, we will make those changes. But we do, that is a purchase material that we also create. Now, there are some, you know, box materials that you don't have the option to make changes to that you may want to review and use in your clinic. Um, and then, of course, creative materials. Just remember that the INE Advisory Committee must Consider the target audience's education and cultural backgrounds, the standards of the, of the community of the target audience. Um, make sure that the content of the material is factually correct. Determine if it is suitable for the target audience and establish a written record. All family planning program ed, uh, educational materials must be reviewed by the INE Advisory Committee prior to use in the clinic. It's existing material should be reviewed regularly to ensure that they remain current. And I've had several of you contact me to say, we've had no new materials this year. Does this mean we don't have to meet? And technically, for the INE component, no, you don't have to meet. It would be good to meet to review those existing materials to make sure they're still uh, pertinent to the situation. But um, you still have to meet the community component. So if you don't meet for INE purposes, you still need to meet and have a written record of your community participation piece. So either way, you're going to have to have a meeting. <laughs> it would be a good idea to go ahead and continue to review our existing materials, but if there isn't a new material to review, then you can just do the community participation part of that at that meeting. Um, so here are some suggestions that um, were given to us on how to recruit people to participate in the committee, because I know that that is difficult. Um, so when you identify someone that you think might be a good participant in your committee, you want to provide them with a good description of the INE committee. Now, you may have a script that you use to talk to them by phone, or you may actually send them a letter or email that contains this information. But the things you would want to say are, is that your agency provides health services to pr help prevent unintended pregnancies. Now, you may want to elaborate that and say that, that uh, our focus group is low-income men and women or um, teens. It may, if you're, the language you use may be consistent with the needs of your community to help um, underscore the importance of why that committee is, important, is, is needed. Advisory committee members um, assist in evaluating educational material for patients so that they understand exactly what their role will be in that, in that committee. 
Committee members are provided the materials and asked to give feedback. Your participation will not be time consuming. So sometimes just telling someone, we're not gonna need much of your time, it's one day a year, you know, and you're only committed for this one year, maybe. Um, what might help them? And then once once you get them to agree verbally or by um, email or, or, or letter, follow up with an introductory confirmation letter. This is something like, you know, thank you for agreeing to participate in this group. We plan to meet on whatever day and we will be sending you those materials prior to that day. Just give them, you know, a little bit more information but make it a little bit more official so that they do feel like it's an important thing that they're participating in. Some more suggestions. Now this is more for your end of it and for my end of it, but more for your end of it than anything else. If you can create a membership list with names and titles, part of the reason um, that you want all this information is so that you can demonstrate that you have a diverse um, population in the committee and you can show that in your notes and um, records if you're audited. But it should name, have the name and title of that person their contact information, and if they're affiliated with an organization, like you know a high school or um, church group or something, you need to put that information on there. Um, you may also want to include an organization description or mission, so that if someone isn't familiar what that organization is, there's more information there. And sometimes that stuff can just be cut and pasted directly from a website. This also will help you in the future if you have members drop off in recruiting new members. You'll be able to look through that list and see what you need, who you need to be looking for, and where you might go to find those people. Community participation. So moving on uh, from the INE to the community part of this. Agencies must provide an opportunity for participation in the development, implementation, and evaluation of the project by persons broadly representative of all significant elements of the population to be served and by persons in the community knowledgeable about the community's needs for family planning services. So that's one thing that I think is important that we want to make sure we get people on board who understand the purpose of the family planning program and why it's needed. And it may just be a matter of, of taking someone in and educating them before you join them to the committee because they, they may just not be able to connect those dots. The only other requirement for the Community Participation Committee is that it meets annually. So that's why we do INE committee annually is because we're doing our community participation as part of that. So I think what we may need to, in our documentation, change the name to, you know, INE slash Community Participation Committee. Um, make sure the word advisory is used in there so that they know that those people are an advisory board. Um, but that, that is the reason that we require you to, to meet annually. I know that that has been a bit of confusion in the past since we don't always have something new to review. But you have to do the community participation piece annually. So if you are meeting for community, um, the things that you can do are discuss ideas for community outreach, ideas for increasing the number of patients served, and ideas for improving access to service. And the list could go on and on and on. But these are some basic things that you can do with a, a community piece, and that can be written up in the minutes and sent in. Um, I know that we have continued in the past to ask for your INE community, your INE committee minutes, but if you aren't reviewing something, maybe we should just change the name to say our INE community participation committee minutes, because you may just be doing these things during that meeting. Okay, that's really all I have about that. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Implementation of basically what you're doing, we're already doing this. Right. Okay, so yes. basically we're just changing the name. So is this like a July 1st kind of an issue? I mean, we need to go ahead and just revamp. I mean, I, I can see that the only thing I need to do is add the uh, community participation education and project promotions at the top of the minute. Right. Because during the course of the meeting and the materials, if you put the right materials into your INE committee, we'll generate the discussion about bringing in more patients or, or you know, outreaching to certain groups. But we may or may not have used that as information to put in the minute. Exactly. Because it wasn't required. So, 
So if I just had my IONI committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, most people did. I, the minutes, the IONI committee minutes, minutes have been rolling in this past week. So I know everybody's just doing it to meet that deadline. And they've been good. What I've been seeing has the community piece in there. And I think if we are audited with what we already have, they'll see that that is our community piece, even if it's labeled the other way. I just think for our own mindset, we may want to start thinking of it a little different and, and writing it a little different. Um, because the requirements, you know, a lot, most of the Title Ten requirements really have not changed. Um, they look a little bit more vague than they did, but they haven't really <laughs> changed. And we're trying to currently take our, our newest guidelines and requirements and review our AR and CCSG, and there will probably be, you know, an emergency uh, revision done later on, which isn't really an emergency, but it's just because we didn't have time when they came out to make those changes before July 1. But this is probably something that I will change in there, not because it's had any changes, but just to clarify for us that, that we are doing this as, as one thing and it's both pieces so that it will be clear to everyone. The only thing that you haven't mentioned, and that's the reason that my minutes are, you know, we have our meeting every March, mm -hmm. but I always wait for the Board of Health to meet right. and, and present that information to them before I send them to you. Mm -hmm. So they just met two weeks ago. And if you don't get your INE committee in before that March meeting, right. then you can't submit it at that time. So it, is it still necessary to run it by the Board of Health before we submit the minutes to you? I don't, I don't see, see that that's that 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 a requirement. It's well, not a requirement for us. Now, that okay. may be something that, you know, you, know you and board. your local board may want to do. That's between you and your board. But for so us, we don't need that. Would be much, much of a blessing. <laughs> 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 I mean, it may be something right. that they wanted to approve before we saw it. Yeah, but no, they did not. It okay. something that we thought we needed to submit to them just to let them know what was going on, give them an opportunity to look at materials over which some do, and you know, most of our board members have been there for quite some time. They just kind of just pass it around the table and give it back to them. Right. You know, but uh, yeah, I think it would maybe newer members might be interested, but they were more interested in the minutes than they were the material. Right. Yes. So, okay. Any other questions? All right. Oh, Hi. Um, this is Ava from Madison County. Can you hear me? Hi, Ava. Yes, I can. Hey. Hear you. Um, I was just wanting to clarify um, the forms that we've been reviewing at our INE committee um, were our forms that we've developed, but also all of those FPEMs. Yeah. Um, and so I, the way I'm, re I'm understanding this uh, meeting today is that those necessarily do not have to be reviewed because they haven't been changed. But if you all on the state level changed any of those required state forms, then we would have the committee right. review those? Yes. And okay. we, would, we would let you know if that happens. Yeah. Okay. The only thing that's changed on any of them um, recently is that a revision date was changed, to, or not a revision, a review date has changed to show that we've looked at them. But other okay. than that, the content hasn't changed, so there's nothing to look at. But it is good to review them regularly. Right. You know, we've reviewed them. don't have to. We did review those at our last meeting, but, you know, uh, you know, the comment was made that there, we can't make changes to those, but what we can do is send any suggestions that the committee right. has to you about those particular forms. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Emily. Thank Great you. job. Thank you for presenting that important information. I just wanted to um, let you all know, as uh, in regards to the next portion of Tracy Bond's presentation, what I'll do is ask Tracy and TJ if they would uh, be willing to come up and we can uh, retake that half an hour segment and then we'd be able to uh, hopefully splice it into the archive version of this presentation. I don't know if that's um, possible from an IT perspective, but I'm certainly willing to ask, and I, because I um, sure want you all to be able to have access to that information and that, and that training. So I do apologize for the technical difficulties, and I'll do what I can to get that 
that information included into the archived webcast in case you all want to view it at a later time. Uh, speaking of the SS, uh, the C, excuse me, SS, the CCSG, Emily, um, uh, the CCSG, the, the uh, July version was released on Tuesday. It was posted on the uh, local health operations VPH website. Um, it, the effective date is July 15th for incorporation, uh, uh, implementation of those new guidelines. Um, I want to thank the Nurse Executive Committee membership for their review. Um, all of the program, the DPH program contacts and leaders who developed the changes. Um, Mary Mullins, who spent numerous hours, too many uh, to count, in, in incorporating those changes. Um, and Dr. White, of course, for her review and signature of those clinical guidelines. I, I've received two or three emails, one about a format, formatting a, a particular form um, and where the uh, revision listings was and um, where, they, where the signature page was. So fairly um, straightforward questions. I've not received any questions so far about content. Um, certainly, if you do have programmatic specific questions, feel free to contact the program leads uh, or myself, and I'll be happy to uh, serve as a liaison in getting that information for you. But um, we did want to, since we were a little bit late having this, the uh, CCSG release, we wanted to be sure to allow um, a month for you all to uh, review the information, have your uh, staff trainings, um, and then be able to get your physician signature for the protocols. And so we hope that that, uh, it's not July 1st, it's, but it's July 15th, and we put, I, I really felt that that extra two weeks was important uh, to give you all time and not to rest you all in, in uh, implementing those guidelines. So any feedback that you have, either regarding the content or the process, uh, please feel free to let me know. Wanted to also remind you all that I sent out an email, um, I believe it was June 10th um, or 11th regarding the, uh, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services State Fair. The State Fair is coming up August 14th through 24th. Um, if you are interested and available to work in the Blood Pressure Management Health Education booth, um, please contact Becky Kissick Hake, um, K I S S I C K hyphen H A K E. Or, or myself, and I'll be glad to forward that information to Becky. There's two time slots, 9 to 2.30 or 2 to 7.30. Uh, tickets to the fair and parking uh, tickets are provided to participants. Um, and then if you do want to participate, of course, you will need your supervisor's um, approval or authorization for that to work that shift and shifts and drive time count hour for hour as a work day. So if you haven't worked the state fair before, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to get out there and meet people from all over the state and, um, actually, and you know, uh, see, see folks maybe from your hometown, your community, and be able to um, talk to, talk to um, our citizens of our state about blood pressure and hypertension preventive health services. So I just wanted to, to remind you all about that. The next bullet, or what next piece of information I wanted to share is that we are working on scheduling the fall APRN conference for the local health department APRNs. Right now we're looking at um, mid-September, mid the second to third week in September. And what we're trying to do is coordinate the My Old Kentucky home site along with Dr. Farr's availability, because I certainly don't want to make reservations with my old Kentucky home and then have it not, not have Dr. Farr be able to attend. So uh, coordinating those two uh, schedules, and then as soon as I get a, a confirmation, then I'll send that information out uh, to the APRNs, and certainly I'll CC the nurse leaders and the directors about that information. Um, I will ask, and I'll also send out, I don't know if I'll do a monkey, survey monkey or whatever, but I really uh, would love to have input 
uh, from the APRNs regarding the content uh, on the agenda because that has our agenda be more the most uh, relevant and appropriate for your APRN. So please um, encourage them to send their, their thoughts and ideas for the agenda to me and we'll, be, we'll do our best to incorporate those ideas. And then lastly, I wanted to share, if you may not have um, had the opportunity to read your KBN Connection, the, the spring 2014 edition, I just wanted to remind you all that the Senate Bill 7, which is about um, APRN prescriptive authority, that legislation was signed into law uh, on February 26th, and in effect, uh, this, this law will remove the requirement for an APRN to have a collaborative agreement for prescriptive authority for non-scheduled drugs. Remember, this is our Kappa NS. There's the Kappa for scheduled medicines. There's a, there's a, a collaborative agreement for non-scheduled medicines. This legislation specifically addresses the non-scheduled medication collaborative agreement and the APRN would have to have uh, a collaborative agreement in place uh, for four years uh, with a physician before that requirement would no longer have to be met. So the law also establishes, <clears throat> promulgated that there would be a committee of three APRNs and three physicians to assist APRNs in identifying and securing a collaborative physician in a variety of situations. I think that's, in my mind, that's one of the biggest pieces of the legislation that could be helpful for local health departments because I have received uh, several calls in the past, over the past many years, where a local health department was not able to identify or secure a collaborative physician. Um, so that's, that will be a, a good resource for us all, I think. Where we are right now is, we're not, we, the Kentucky Board of Nursing, they are in the process of reviewing and updating the regulation that will be linked and tied to that collaborative agreement requirement. Um, and then they're also going to be de developing that logistics piece, how that law will be actually implemented into practice. <clears throat> KBN says that they will be in contact with all of the APRNs. They have, you know, they know, they know how to get in touch with all of us. And so they'll be able to get in touch with the APRNs and give them an update. I've also, uh, I will be contacting Pam Hagen, who is the APRN practice consultant for KBN, and ask her to include me in that, those updates so I can share that information with all the local health department nurse leaders and the APRNs. I don't, I think this change will be, um, you know, so big, I want to make sure that we provide that information in different, a variety of different ways. Important takeaway from this whole conversation is the law does not go into effect until July 15th. So same day as the CCSG goes into effect. The law will not go into effect. So I don't know if those regulations will be um, ready by July 15th. So as that information becomes available, KBN um, in, the, in the connection, they said they would be contacting APRNs directly and I will, as I receive information, I will be sure to share that information with you all as well. What we will also need to do is um, when, when the time comes is to update the AR in that personnel section where we have the sample uh, collaborative agreement and I'll need to add a sentence or two in a, uh, about the change for a collaborative agreements and reference the new regulatory language that goes along with that. Uh, new law. So more to come on that. I just wanted to m give you the status update. Uh, don't have not seen any regulations or any uh, draft regulations to that point, but I wanted to let you know and bring that to your attention that if, if you haven't read the KBN Connection, it's in there, and if I receive information, I'll be sure to let you know. Are there any questions or comments from from the field um, about any other topics that we that we haven't covered today that I may may take back and and review or research for you all. Okay, Joanne. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much. We did end a little bit early. I 
at see I, I try um, every time to get as close to three hours as I can and if we would have had been able to have the NES presentation we would have been right on the money right on right on the minute so I do apologize for that and I'll do what I can to, to get that information out to you all so have a great day great rest of the summer and uh, feel free to contact us if you need anything at all bye-bye